the standard deviation of the employment population ratio is 8.86 percentage points. The TANF benefit for a family of three, its standard deviation is equal to $99.03. The covariance in these two variables is negative 24.7 percent dollars. To compute the estimate of the slope, we substitute in the covariance of x and y, which is negative 24.7 percent dollars. We substitute in the variance for x, which is the square of the standard deviation. The units up here again are percent dollars. Units down here are dollar squared. Dollars and dollars cancel, leaving us a slope that is equal to negative point zero zero two five percent per dollar. To compute the lead squared's estimate of the intercept, we plug in the mean for y, 50.23%. We plug in the mean for x, $250.04. We also plug in the estimated slope, which is negative 0.0025% per dollar. So this expression here, dollars cancel, leaving percent. So we have percent minus percent. Hence the intercept is equal to 50.869 percent. And the way we can think of the intercept is the value of y when x is 0. When x is 0, state TANF benefit would be 0, and we expect the employment population ratio of that state to be equal to nearly 51 percent. We now use the predicted equation 50.869 minus 0.025x. We compute the predicted values by substituting in 110.66 into x1. So 110.66 times a negative 0.0025 and then adding to this to 50.869 gives us 50.59. The total variation in the first observation is equal to 110.66 minus 250.04 and then we square that difference and we get 19,425.76. The total variation in the first observation of y is 52.35 minus 50.23 then we square that difference and we get 4.47. The squared deviation between the first observed value of y and the first predicted value of y is found by first subtracting 52.35 and 50.59. When we square that difference, we get 3.10. The first square deviation in the predicted value and the sample mean of y is found by taking 50.59 and subtracting from it 50.23. Squaring the difference gives you the second predicted value is found by plugging 622.81 into this equation, which gives us 489.28. The total variation in the second observation of x, or the second squared deviation from x's mean, is equal to 622.81 minus 250. When we score that difference, we get 138,957.04. The total variation in y, or the second squared deviation from y's mean, is found by subtracting y, 38.47, from y bar, 50.23. When we score that difference, we get 138.45. The second squared deviation from y's predicted value is found by taking the difference between 38.47 and 49.28 and squaring that difference, which yields 117.04. The second deviation that exists between the predicted value of y and its mean is found by taking y hat, 49.28, and subtracting off 50.23, 
Squaring the difference yields 0 0.90. And then we just repeat this for all remaining observations. The total variation x is equal to 970,931.62. The total variation in y is equal to 7,764.76. This is known as the, the total sum of squares. Now, the y minus y hat is the residual or the estimated error. When we add up all 100 squared errors, we get the sum of squared errors equal to 7,758.48. When we total these 100 numbers, we get the sum of squares due to regression. If there is only one independent variable, x, in simple regression, the t and f test will tell us the same thing. The data will either support or not support the hypothesis that the slope coefficient beta 1 is equal to 0. Theory told us that this coefficient was not equal to 0. Actually, our theory suggested that this coefficient was negative, which means the larger the welfare check, the less low-income single mothers will work. To test for significance at the 5% level, we need to compute the t-stat, which involves computing several statistics. Regression software packages compute these for us. For instructional purposes, we compute them below. The mean squared error, also known as s-square in regression analysis, is equal to the sum of square errors divided by its degrees of freedom, n minus 2. The sum of squares error on the previous slide was equal to 7,758.48. The sample size is 100, and we subtract 2 from that to give us our degrees of freedom. The mean square error is equal to 79.17. Taking the square root gives us the standard error of the estimate, 8.898. The standard error of coefficient B1, SB1, is equal to the standard error of the estimate divided by the square root of the total variation in x. The standard error of the estimate is 8.898. The total variation in x on the previous slide was 970,931.62. Hence the standard error of the slope coefficient, b1, is equal to 0 0.0090. The t-stat is just the ratio of the estimated coefficient, b1, and its standard error. The estimated coefficient was negative 0 0.0025. With the standard error equal to 0 0.0090, the t stat is negative 0.277. Since alpha is equal to 0 0.05, and the null hypothesis, this is a two-tailed test, hence we divide the alpha by 2, which is 0 0.025. The degrees of freedom for this test is equal to 98. The t critical value is found in column 0.025 of the t distribution table and in row 98. The intersection of column 0.025 and row 98 is 1.984. The lower critical value is a negative 1.984. The t stat is in between the two critical values. Hence, we cannot reject the null hypothesis that the slope coefficient is equal to zero. Now, recall the discussion about omitted variable bias. Our theory suggests that the coefficient is actually negative, not equal to zero. In simple regression, we have one independent variable. Hence, there's a huge potential for omitted variable bias because there are a lot of things that influence the employment population ratio of low-income single mothers. And we've only included one factor in the analysis. So the fact that we cannot reject the null hypothesis suggests that we have an omitted variable bias problem. Now, if the estimated coefficient B1 was statistically significant, we'd interpret its value as follows. B1, again, is just the rise over the run. 
the rise being the change in Y, or the change in the employment population ratio of low-income single mothers. The run is the change in X, or the change in the welfare check that is paid to low-income single mothers. Now B1, which is the estimate of beta 1, B1 was found to be equal to negative 0 0.0025 in our simple regression analysis. We can rewrite that as negative 0 0.0025 over plus 1, which is still equal to negative 0 0.0025. Doing this makes interpreting the slope coefficient easier. Now, because negative 0 0.0025 is so small, I'm going to multiply this fraction, negative 0 0.0025 plus 1, times 100 over 100. If I plug this into a calculator, I will get this value. So this is perfectly legitimate. Okay, so now the change in x is a plus 100, an increase of $100. The change in y is a decrease of 0.25 percentage points. So the interpretation of B1, had it been statistically significant, this is what we would say. Increasing monthly benefit levels, X1, for a family of three by $100 lowers the employment population ratio of low-income single mothers by 0.25 percentage points. Since the estimated coefficient B1 is statistically insignificant, increasing monthly benefit levels for a family of three has no effect on the employment population ratio. This is what Excel outputs when you perform regression in Excel. Notice the standard error of the estimate is exactly what we calculated previously. Here we have the sum of squares due to regression due to error and total sum of squares. The total degrees of freedom is equal to the degrees of freedom for the sum of squares due to error plus the sum of squares due to regressions degrees of freedom. The total sum of squares is equal to the sum of the sum of squares due to regression and the sum of squares due to error. The mean square due to regression is equal to the sum of squares due to regression divided by its degrees of freedom. Now the degrees of freedom for the sum of squares due to regression is equal to 1 because there was only one independent variable, namely x. The mean square due to error is equal to the sum of squares due to error divided by its degrees of freedom. The f statistic is equal to the mean squares due to regression divided by the mean squares due to error. Down here we have the estimate of beta 0, which is the estimated intercept and we have its standard error. We divide these two and we get the t-stat for b0. This looks familiar. We just uh, showed how the t-stat was computed on the previous slide. We take the estimated slope coefficient of the x, which in this case is the TANF benefit level for our family 3. We divide it by its standard error and we get the t-stat. If the p-value is less than 5%, which this one is, then this coefficient is statistically significant at the 5% level. Because this p-value is bigger than 5%, this coefficient is statistically insignificant at the 5% level. The r-square is found by taking the sum of squares due to regression and dividing by the sum of squares total. To interpret the r-square, we write out this sentence. If r-square is equal to 0 0.0008, we'll find that by 100% gives us 0.08%. And since y is the employment population ratio, we're going to replace this red expression and this red variable with what they are equal to. Hence, 0.08% of the variability in the employment population ratio of low-income single mothers can be explained by the model. In other words, 
the model does not appear to fit the data very well. 